Welcome to everyone who's joining us on the Local Churchology podcast for today's conversation with Dr. David Fitch. My name is Tyler Tavares. I'm an associate pastor at Coburg Alliance Church in Coburg, Ontario. My co-host today is Daryl Buckle, and he's the lead pastor at Coburg Alliance. And in today's conversation, we're talking all about the Christian Missionary Alliance in Canada and in the U.S., about patriarchy and hierarchy. Yeah, you heard that right. And one of David's books called The Church of Us Versus Them. And who knows what else we're going to talk about today. It's going to be great. David Fitch is the Betty R. Lindner Chair of Evangelical Theology at Northern Seminary in Chicago, Illinois. Well, the Chicago area anyway. He's an ordained pastor with the Christian and Missionary Alliance. He has helped plant four churches, at least four churches. He's been featured in Christianity Today, Outreach Magazine, and numerous other publications. His books include The End of Evangelicalism, Discerning a New Faithfulness for Mission, and Prodigal Christianity, 10 Signposts into the Missional Frontier, among others. David, it's great to have you on the podcast with us today. Yeah, so so glad to do this and be with you, and, and thanks for inviting me. Yeah, so you've been in the U.S. for a long time. Uh, you were born in the States, but you spent a lot of time in Canada. So what do you miss most about the Canadian life? Well, uh, you know, as a little boy growing up on the east side of Hamilton, um, the things I love, miss, you know, the good old fish and chips, the British fish and chips mm. on Queenston, Queenston there. In, in Are you talking about Hutches? No, no, we went there too, but that, but that was not in my neighborhood. And uh, also uh, the outdoor hockey rinks. I love outdoor oh, yeah. hockey rinks. And most of them had boards back then. And uh, that's where I learned the great sport of hockey. So Canada, yeah. go Canada. And of course, Can Canadian people uh, know how to get along a little better than. than <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the Canadian politeness is a real thing. It, right. it is. It is, at least from those days when I grew up there. And I'm still in Canada a lot and I still feel it. So uh, yeah. congrats to you Canadians on maintaining some civility <laughs> in these crazy times. <laughs> well, that's great. Well, you, you know, you have, uh, speaking of Canada, speaking of the U.S. and the Alliance, you have a long history with the Alliance, you know, with the Christian and Missionary Alliance in Canada and in the U.S. So can you tell us a little bit about your Alliance story to get us started? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah. Uh, you know, I go all the way back to the founding of the Christian Missionary Alliance. Uh, this Canadian guy named A.B. Simpson uh, mm -hmm. was in New York City in the Gospel Tab. It's a long story, but my grandfather was the last assistant pastor to A.B. Simpson in the Gospel yeah. Tabernacle. And then uh, and my dad was the second to last baby dedicated by A.B. Simpson. So I feel like I've got it going pretty strong in my yeah, yeah. blood. Cool. Yeah. Uh, and then my grandfather started, went from there to start the Ottawa Gospel Tabernacle in the 1920s in Winnipeg. And my, my, my family was pastors in Owen Sound, Ontario, and in Hamilton, where I spent most of my elementary, uh, middle school, and secondary years. So, yes, uh, we have a lot of alliance, and I'm yes. still alliance. Yes. What I'm kept you alliance? I mean, alliance, if I yeah. can put Yes. And, and so you ended up, you know, you made this shift from Canada to the U.S. and you stayed Alliance. So what kept you, you know, bleeding Alliance, so to speak? Well, um, uh, I wish I could explain that. I was trying to tell I was in some meetings in New York City last week and I was trying to tell my friends uh, that I think the, the Alliance doesn't always uh, know how uh, I, I actually said something like, I think the Alliance sometimes hates me in the, in the U S but I love the Christian missionary Alliance. I just, yeah. I just think our history, I think our theology, um, um, all the things that talk about uh, our, the fourfold gospel. I mean, folks, this is, this is the stuff. Um, and uh, I just think this is the kind of thing, this is the kind of theology and stream that I'm most comfortable in. I, it's not that I'm hunted, hunted around for other places and other denominations, and I'm not saying all of the denominations are inferior. This is just home for me, mm -hmm. and I'm 100% comfortable in the Christian Missionary Alliance. Yeah, cool. So, so when we talk about the Christian Missionary Alliance, what does that mean? And, and 
to tie it directly to our conversation and really the point of the podcast, the, the handful of episodes that we produced so far is how does understanding who the alliance is maybe impact our thinking on the topic of gender roles and leadership in the church? It's a big question, but how are those two things integrated? Yeah. Um, you know, not everybody will agree with me on this, but I see the history of the alliance as, um, squarely within the holiness movements of the last of, of the late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, I see our emphasis on divine healing, on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, on the filling of the Holy Spirit, on sanctification. We call it holy sanctification, holy sanctified. Uh, I, I see the, the, the main uh, uh, figures in the Alliance as being forerunners in understanding uh, the holiness movements. And of course, that, that pushed us out into global mission all around the world in marvelous ways. And so once we agree with that, now, you know, A.B. Simpson left the Presbyterian world, reformed, and became, uh, he was somewhat eclectic, but I think the emphases are holiness. Some people say, no, reformed theology fits within the alliance in some ways. I, I don't see how that really works. But um, if you believe like I do, uh, that the holiness churches were birthed out of a movement of the Holy Spirit, out of a recognition of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the power and movement of the Holy Spirit to work in people's lives, not only inside the building, but outside the building, then I think you're going to look at, at power and authority in the church and the offices differently, as opposed to, uh, uh, say, Reformed denominations or maybe... Uh, Anglicans, or those within the established traditions of Christendom, I'll call it, you know, office took precedent, a hierarchy. Um, things were organized, let's say, for efficiency um, and very much top down. Uh, within the mission movements, the gifts of the Holy Spirit became once again uh, the impetus, the source of authority and power in the church. And so office really follows after the gifts. Uh, you're recognized for your authority and giftedness, and that's facilitated through, say, becoming an ordained pastor. And so the gifts really push for authority. Once you do that, well, then women and men are equal participants, mm -hmm. are equal recipients of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And it makes no sense to exclude women from the offices of the church. Um, and, I, and I do believe that makes all the difference in the world. And that's why I believe the Nazarene church, the missionary church, the Wesleyan Methodist church, the free Methodist church, the four square gospel church, the assemblies of all the churches that really have been founded within the holiness movement and, and have been friends and co-laborers with the Christian missionary Alliance. They have all ordained women from the beginning. I think mm -hmm. that's the history of it. Mm -hmm. It's good. Yeah. So you mentioned a couple of things, you know, you, you kind of touched on hierarchy a little bit. Um, maybe we can touch on hierarchy and patriarchy a little bit and how those things have sort of influenced, if we can unpack this a little bit more, how those have influenced this whole conversation around, you know, gender roles. How far back does it go? Uh, when do things shift? I mean, I imagine they didn't shift completely with the holiness movement, but there's obviously this big emergence of, you know, the spirit gifting that comes with the holiness movement. Yeah. Um, so again, like I come from uh, not only the holiness stream, you might even say I come from a Pentecostal leaning hmm. stream. Um, uh, but I also come from an Anabaptist understanding of ecclesiology. And, and most of us Anabaptists see that uh, the first couple hundred years of the church where it's vibrant years filled with the Holy Spirit, a work among the various places. And it grew from a small little group of people to uh, a little over a million people by the time Constantine, the Roman emperor in 300 AD, got saved. Uh, there's some controversy around that, but, but you know, to oversimplify it, Constantine then, as, as opposed to a church being um, um, persecuted by culture and by the government, it now became aligned with the power 
of government. And we had things like the Nicene Creed and so forth. Well, anyways, for the first time there, we see some changes in the way we see hierarchy and authority and uh, patriarchy for that matter. Uh, for the first time, we go, we see that women, I mean, Scott McKnight, my, my uh, co-laborer at Northern Seminary has written about this. I, I would recommend uh, Alan Kreider's book, uh, The Patient Ferment of the Early Church, to understand what was going on. But once we got to Constantine, then we had a whole new arrangement. We, we, and, and, and to be fair to our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters, you, ha- you went from, I think Rodney Stark says, we went from a million to 70 million Christians in the span of about 100 years. Mm-hmm. And so they had to organize quickly. Mm-hmm. And, and so whereas people were out in the streets uh, anointing people and healing, well, well, the, the, the church needed to like say, okay, priests, you need to get this under control and you need to get some doctrinal orthodoxy here and teach people what healing is. So they put priests in charge and all that changed mm-hmm. uh, from being a very a multiple gifted, multi-pastor, multi-led church to a hierarchy. And and so do you understand now uh, every time, now you look back the last 2000 years, there's been outbreak of mission um, and there's been criticized, criticism for the coercion and or the hierarchy within the church. And the church has had outbreaks of mission and it's always included the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the work of women alongside and in mutuality with men. Um, So it's not been just one big disaster since Constantine in Mm -hmm. 300 AD uh, did the edict 313 AD did the edict of Milan. It's, it's been up and down and wherever we see the church align with power authority become the established religion, quote unquote, it seems like we organize from top down and it always seems I've, I could give you a few theories on why this is, but it always seems like the men take charge and the women come under men in the organization of the church patriarchy when that kind of coercive political arrangement happens in the church. Hmm. Uh, That's why a patriarchy and hierarchy are tied together. We can't ignore it. And um, that's not the way of Jesus. That's Hmm. not uh, the way he works. You know, I think I, I feel like Ephesians, Chapter five, beginning with verse twenty-one. My yes, twenty-one. My alliance quizzing background almost failed me there. Uh, uh, I believe Paul is overturning patriarchy. He just doesn't say, "Women submit yourselves to your husbands." He says, "Husbands die for your wives." At the heading, he says, "Submit yourselves." All of all of the arrangements within society, all the roles. Submit yourselves one to another. He maintains headship, but headship or a role uh, for men in relation to women is never patriarchy. If, if you assume that the Trinity, which which in in First Corinthians Paul talks about as the head of the the Father and uh, is head of Christ, Christ is the head of the church. You you it's not hierarchy; it's mutuality and its roles within marriage. I threw a lot at you. I hope I didn't. Uh, overwhelm me with that so is can can um can we understand complementarianism only as hierarchy or is there a way to understand it in opposition to hierarchy well um okay so uh unfortunately i think complementarianism got aligned with hierarchy or with patriarchy the best of complementarianism is mutuality. Hmm. But so often complementarianism, that is the split and the, not the split, but the uh, distinction between roles between men and women and that they are complementary so often uh, ends up being hierarchical or one over the other. Now, you know, Jesus says, Mark chapter 10 to the disciples. This time they're talking about political authority. Disciples are going, who gets to rule over who when the kingdom comes? And Jesus says, there shall be not so among you. Hmm. The, the first shall be last and, and, or the last shall be first. And it's almost like he's overturning hierarchy. He, well, he is overturning hierarchy. And it's almost like he's saying, okay, if I put the woman first, it means that she is actually uh, the one who's leading, uh, you know, 
think about when you submit to somebody, like when you're a leader and you're in a church situation with, say, your other pastors or elders, and you have an issue that you are discerning together and you put a proposal forth. I propose in relation to this issue, we do A, B, C, and D. I submit it to you. What do you think? That That's leadership, right? But it's also submitting one to another. Hmm. Okay. So submitting is not necessarily not leadership. Hmm. Did I confuse everybody with that? It's great. Yep. No, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, no, it's a recording. So I can just, if I'm confused, I'll just go back and listen to it again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Very good. No, that made a lot of sense. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate that. Yeah. yeah cool. I just think it's so important uh, to realize that what's going on is God enters the world through Jesus Christ, gives the Holy Spirit to his disciples, and they begin the church, the, 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 the people of Jesus under his lordship and reign. And it starts working through all the systems to overthrow the patriarchy and the hierarchy and the abuse and the coercion. And this is why it's such a shame that the church has to buy into these systems. And we see so much abuse in our culture and we see so much sexual abuse and other forms of abuse uh, accused of pastors. And this is so grievous to the Holy Spirit because it's the opposite of what God wants to do through his church in the world. Mm -hmm. This is why we, the Christian and Missionary Alliance, must work this this issue of women and men together in ministry out because it's essential to witnessing to the gospel mm -hmm. for for uh to to our culture mm -hmm. yeah I, I love that sometimes you hear in this conversation that uh that you know subordination or or you know male authority is an essential to the gospel actually heard it that strong before and it just seems to me that it it has to be i don't know first of all it's I, I kind of want to sometimes say it's a peripheral issue, but certainly not essential to the gospel that, that women would submit to men. I, I don't understand how that fits in with the, the kingdom and the cross and the, you know, like you said, Ephesians chapter five. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, and it's, it's, it's essential. I believe, uh, you know, um, if, if we're going to engage a world that is no longer Christianized, uh, we do not engage it through postures of worldly power. We do not come in, like, like down here in the States, we think we're going, to, we're, we're going to solve the sexual ethics problem of our culture by enforcing laws against abortion. Okay, now, first of all, I believe abortion is an affront, is a tragedy every time and it is an affront to god's good creation and it, it's it's a sexual ethic issue as well as a health issue for various reasons but all that to say we cannot enforce our morale our moral convictions about marriage and abortion on a culture that does not believe because uh uh, it'll just reverb, rebound back, and, and, and it is, we're already getting pushback on it here in the States. Instead, we need a posture of being with people and allowing God to work interrelationally in our neighborhoods to, uh, for the Holy Spirit to work in conviction and, and so that the power of the Holy Spirit's at work, not my power over somebody. Mm. And there in those spaces, God brings people to himself. That's what the church is and needs to be in mission. And if we can't do it in the church, if we keep posturing ourselves over people, then we won't be able to do it outside the church and in the neighborhoods and in the, in the various places where God is at work bringing people to himself. Okay, you, uh, you said earlier organizing for mission as opposed to organizing for hierarchy. So you got to tease that out a, a little bit more. Yeah. What, what, are, what is it going to look like uh, to, to say we shouldn't be arguing necessarily about who's in charge, but organizing for mission? Help us out. Right, right. Okay, so there's a lot of different issues there, Daryl. Uh, well, one is, you know, when we organize from top down, when we have a senior person at the very top, what tends to happen is 
all decisions get all organizational decisions get pushed in and up instead of down and out. And, and so uh, we might have uh, Joe, Joe farmer down there. Uh, I know I, by the way, not, not dissing the farmers, uh, Joe <laughs> Smith. Careful now. Oh, we, we... <laughs> that's right. Uh, I'm all for farmers. Uh, I, I was just trying to come up with a, 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 a last name that was generic, but anyways, uh, Joe Smith is say working in, um, one of the, uh, homeless shelters here in town and the people without homes were seeing some stuff go on there but relationally with a meal that happens on Sunday morning, uh, it might clash a little bit with the Sunday, Sunday school hour at 9 a.m. So, and we need money and support because something's happening in the meal there where people are talking about God and it's being revealed what's happening, actually, some of the evils that are going on in that shelter. So anyways, the person comes in to the church and says, I need both help and I got a conflict uh, at 9 a.m., is it all right if I uh, if if I get support for this ministry from friends in the church? And I need some. And the per- person at the top says, "Well, wait a minute. Our, our program is 9 a.m. Sunday school, 10 o'clock church. That's not going to work. And furthermore, we can't give you any more money. But if so, we push the we push the decisions in towards the church centrally and up towards the top so that the one person starts making all this. It's his, normally it's a him, his decision alone and his vision for the church alone that he is running. But God wants to do something beyond just one person's vision. He wants to be at work in the neighborhoods, in the communities. And there's things that we need to bless out there. So we need to push the decisions down and out. And so Joe Smith, what's happening over there? Maybe we should uh, have a Sunday school in uh, the homeless shelter. Imagine that Uh, after a 10 a.m. What do you think about that? Do you have a gifted person? Oh, yes. One of the people who was without homes actually went to seminary 20 years ago at Northern Seminary, and he's been hurting and he won and God's calling him to teach Sunday school. Let's bless that. And actually another church starts. Now, that was never in the mind of up and in. We have to push them. And this is why hierarchy, frankly, isn't going to work in mission. It has to be uh, an alive uh, mutuality of leaders, both mm-hmm. men and women on the ground, organizing and developing and a vision for what God's doing around us. Hmm. So good. I've heard for, uh, Alan Hirsch call that apostolic DNA or something like that. The idea of empowering everyone to uh, be whatever kingdom agents in their neighborhoods, communities, whatever. Absolutely. And, and of course, no one's dissing or no one's dismissing the importance of the Sunday gathering, like sometimes my friend Alan Hurst does. I actually believe we need a Sunday morning gathering, but we also need uh, a a house a church, uh, a house gathering in the neighborhood to disciple one another and pray for the neighborhood, as well as being in the places uh, of hurt and pain and loneliness and despair like that homeless shelter. We need three spaces, not one. I believe that's Acts chapter 2, 42 to 45. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's how we need to shape the church for mission. Yeah, so. and and so your uh, thesis here then, Dave, is that uh, when, we, when we limit this by either whether it's structurally in some of our hierarchical leadership structures uh, or with complementarianism with uh you know patriarchal structures that it's going to limit some of that missional um potential missional impact yes uh again uh we need to push the authority uh down and out we need to empower people to recognize their gifts That doesn't mean there's no guidance. There's no pastoral theological. I have seen plenty of churches go off the rails without theological guidance. Hmm. Um, So there has to be theological authority. Historically, the church has understood that through ordination processes. So we still need you guys out there, ordained pastors uh, who, who theologically can provide the guidance and the nurture 
uh, for the house churches and all the missions in the various neighborhoods. But we need to empower those people also to use their gifts and to, uh, it, it's so important that the church be unleashed these days into mission as opposed to just uh, be organized into a set of programs in a local place. Hmm. So Dave, I can only imagine when uh, my Christian Missionary Alliance brethren in the States hear you talk, kind of stresses them out. Um, and so I want, I, want to, I want to sort of pull out, if you can, this kind of conversation, whether it be, um, you know, women's subordination, whether it be some of this, a, a new imagination for what organizing around gifting instead of organizing around, I don't know, hierarchies or something like yes, that. Yes, office, yep. That's got to that's gotta pull up some uh, fears in people, some resistance. The one we often get is things like the slippery slope. Dave, isn't this just a slippery slope if we start empowering everybody? Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, uh, emphasis on the fact that I just finished saying we need theological guidance. I agree. I have seen many churches go off the rails without theological guidance. We could have a whole three or four podcasts on the top four things that drag churches of mission into, you know, craziness. Um, but having said that, you know, we are in a transition period in the history of the church. Um, I don't think there's ever been, well, it's been a long time, I should say, since the church went through uh, such a transition where 50 years ago, when I was living in Hamilton, Ontario, where everybody at uh, my school was, I didn't know it actually, I th but everyone was either a Catholic or a Lutheran or a United Church or something. We've gone from a Christianized majority. Back then, Mark Knoll says Canada was almost, was 90%, was more Christians going to church in Canada in the 60s than they were in the United States to now it's the exact opposite. It's almost like if 12 to 15% are regularly attending church in Canada, that's good. And so this massive transition, it, you know, somebody like me has lived on during this transition, there's habits, um, ways of thinking about church, ways of organizing church, ways of thinking about gender, uh, ways of thinking about engaging the culture that are bad. Well, they're bad habits now. They might have worked in 1965, but they do not work now. We, uh, you know, uh, another hot topic, sexuality. Um, I sign the Christian Missionary Alliance traditional sexuality statement, and I really don't have any qualms about it. Uh, but the discipleship issue, we can't enter the culture and start telling everybody what to do when A, uh, what we mean by marriage is different than what the world means by marriage. I, maybe we should start by sorting that out. So we can't coerce in the culture, yet we want to defend, defend, defend. And, and I can understand why. I mean, our kids are getting barraged with everything under the sun. Um, and, and we want to defend, but it's not going to engage. And we want to accommodate uh, those of us, uh, those people who are the liberals want to, ah, God's at work in all this. Let's just accommodate. That's not doing God's work either. We've got to be present and we've got to be with and allow the work of the Holy Spirit to convict and to transform. And in Luke chapter 10, Jesus says, go pray, cure the sick, and then proclaim the gospel, the mm -hmm. kingdom. Let God work in people's lives and proclaim the gospel that way. So all that to say, I, I'm just saying, um, folks, don't get mad at me. I'm not, not the one who changed the culture in the last 50 years. The, bad, the habits of the past, though, all those defensive habits, all the times when we could just pontificate and reinforce what we already believed in. It was enough to keep people, you know, happy and living the Christian life. We're just not in that world anymore. Mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. uh, we have to do new, we have to engage. We have to be present. We have to reshift how we're going to do mission in the world. Um, Dave, there are folks uh, on the complementarian side of this conversation that uh, suggest that e egalitarianism or, or that. Uh, is an accommodation and that it's going to lead to the other kinds of from gender equality uh, to gender elimination or something. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, there, so there are, there are people who, um, turn egalitarian to, uh, accommodate, uh, um, and, and by the way, I, I just don't, uh, I'm a, I'm a political theorist in one of the hats I wear in the Academy <laughs> and egalitarianism does diminish difference. Uh, we're all equal. We're all the same, but no, that's not God's plan for men and women together in ministry. Actually, first Corinthians 11 when the woman gets up to prophesy, and by the way, if you read David Hill and other scholars from 25 years ago, they they all said, well, prophecy was very similar to preaching. So it's not that much different. And so the woman's getting up in 1 Corinthians 11 to prophesy, and Paul says, wear a head covering as an authority unto you. So he's saying you have authority, but uh, you got to wear a head covering. Now, why the head covering? Well, because women were dismissing the differences between men and one of the big differences in that culture was hair. Hair was a very uh, personal, sensual reality. And so that like Middle Eastern, say, uh, Muslims today, they wore a hijab or a, or a head covering. And it, it, it was a sign that they were a woman. So Paul is basically saying, you need to acknowledge that you are a woman and that you are still a woman, that the eschaton hasn't happened and, and men and women uh, differences uh, there's no marriage or giving in marriage. That's another piece of uh, theory on 1 Corinthians 11. No, the men and the women must stay men and women. And the, dis the distinctions must be maintained for men and women to be in ministry together and to, for women to have authority unto them from, from the Holy Spirit. I think that's so important. We don't want, we don't want women to become men in order to enter the ministry. We want women to be women and we want men to be men. I think so often uh, we keep the hierarchy there and we ask, we say, okay, we're go we the men are going to invite the women to come into our club. And I think that's a big mistake. No, there is men and women are going to maintain. That's why the mutuality is so important. Women bring things to this that men need and men bring things to this that women need. And so I, I often make little jokes about uh, what happens to a church when it's all women pastors and uh, how things can go off the rails. Just like if it's all men pastors, it can go off the rails. I won't go into, because it'll get into some really thick weeds as to uh, caricaturing what men do versus what women do in our culture and how women have been kind of shaped by the culture versus men. But we need women to be women and men to be men. And uh, my, my, my uh, challenge is uh, if we want to truly uh, uh, hold on to those distinctions, the best thing we can do is ordain women alongside men. Hmm. Yeah. Dave, in the early story of the Christian Missionary Alliance, there's all these remarkable women, you know, preaching, going overseas, uh, you know what I mean? Planting churches in other nations and all that. Do you know when things switched in the story of the Alliance to, to start to limit women's roles? Um, uh, you know, Paul King here in the States has written a lot about it. I think he has a few books. Uh, if you go to amazon.ca, of course, it's always a little more expensive for you up there than it is down here sorry about that uh but paul king i think now don't hold me because but but something like between 33 and 40 percent of our churches were planted by women mm -hmm. before world war ii um and um really the whole uh in the u.s i know a lot about the history but the whole distinction between pastor and elder started to happen post-world war ii and then some of the statements about uh, no no men, no women can be elders started to happen but it wasn't really until we became a denomination in the states can't tell you so much about the canadian story but uh, i think it was 1971 that uh, and we became part of national association of evangelicals that uh we started to delineate that women could no longer be pastors. Now that's frankly been confusing because we have two or three different documents saying two or three different things. I won't bore you with the details. So there have been women pastors all along, mm. but, um, 
it's there, there we are coming to a moment of discernment and i believe a holy spirit moment of discernment in in the christian missionary alliance as we especially in the states we now realize we're in mission again and we cannot do mission uh the way we we cannot organize for mission the way we have and you all know where the real growth in the alliance has been since 1971. It's been overseas. Mm -hmm. It hasn't been in the United States. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, that's my understanding. But Paul King is the authority on that. You know, I have a uh, Don Dayton was his mother was Don Dayton's a famous historian of evangelicalism. I studied with him. His mother was Christian Missionary Alliance. His father was Wesleyan Methodist. And um, he uh, uh he said there was an embourgeoisment that happened in the holiness churches. That uh, turn of the last century, 1900, holiness churches were springing up everywhere among the poor. The Nazarenes would actually go send three people to work on the other side of the tracks where the poor were, and they would have a church there, and they'd have to send a pastor there, 100 people, like five years later. They just kept being among the poor. But uh, affluence started to take root because when you find the Lord, you get your life together, you start becoming successful. And he called it M. Bourgeois meant we became bourgeois and we became part of established culture. And now we started to eliminate, even though in most of those denominations, women can still get ordained. No, it was men that had to be pastor. We got part of the established authority structure in in our systems, and this is what hurt us in mission. I think it's time to re re reverse the embourgeoisment of the alliance. Hmm. Um, certainly over the last four, five, six, seven years, there have been a lot of those kind of us versus them um, postures taken. It certainly seems to be a time that's getting, m there's a lot more issues that you can become contentious about. Uh, you wrote a book, the church of us versus them. Um, it, I have a love hate relationship to it because it kind of, it kind of undresses you, uh, <laughs> and shows you my own tendency sometimes to, uh, make enemies or the enemy making machine or, or yeah. to, to give a little bit of leash to an idea, yeah. um, you know, and cause suspicion and things like that. Um, the, 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 I guess the thesis of the book is that there's another way that you don't have to give into the temptation to the enemy making machine, that there is a way to, to learn to navigate complex, uh, situations, you know, and, and it's not just to be flaky and not to have an opinion. Um, do you have any advice for churches navigating this or other contentious situations? Yeah, yeah. We, uh, like I said earlier, we are in this transitional moment. And uh, and all of our worst instincts are going to come out, especially if we're older. You know, we're going to remember the time when it was easy and we could just pontificate from the pulpit and everything would be settled and there'd be maybe one or two disagreements and they'd walk out the back door. But uh, it, it, we need a different kind of leader today, folks. Mm -hmm. uh, we are losing our quote unquote young people. They're walking out the door. They want, they need discussions, conversations, places of mutuality where we can allow the Holy Spirit to work. It's amazing what a simple conversation can do. On this issue of women in ministry, um, I, I uh, developed, and I think I have, um, I think I have it in that book that you just mentioned, Daryl, but we call it IGTHUS. It's, uh, it's the acronym for it seems good to us. It seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us. And if you spell that out, it sounds like IGTHUS. It's really a terrible name, by the way. But anyways, <laughs> we, we, we gather everybody in the church who is interested in this issue. You know, the issue of women in ministry at our church. There were two people. We had had women pastors in our church. There were two men that were upset about it. We called the meeting. Some women were upset that we would even evaluate it all over again. I, we, we weren't going to evaluate it all over again, but we were going to take a good hard look at it all, all over again. And so we we once we started out by asking, what is your what's the significant scripture that drives how you see this issue? 
Where did you get that interpretation? Who taught you that interpretation? Where did it come from? Out of what context? And we started to see how people looked at key texts and why. And then we went in and and kind of deliberately looked at various interpretations and said, here's what makes the most sense. And then we, like Acts chapter 15 does, we saw how God had been using women in our church, how people were getting saved in our church, and how we believe we were called to to empower and facilitate the authority of the Spirit at work in their ministry. And you know those two guys, so we took a, we didn't take a vote, but we just took a measure, one to five. One being you are fully, we came up with a, a statement after five weeks of study together about affirming women in ministry and what this meant for roles of men and women in the church. And and the two guys, both, they couldn't come up. One said, I'm fully agreement. Two said, I am not fully in agreement, but I believe I can trust what the Spirit's doing in the leadership and this group. Five, if you give us a five, that means this is demonic and this is of, of Satan and we cannot agree. And then we have to treat that. But everyone was ones. Those two people were twos. And one of the guys that would always have this big like crease in his forehead is always so. So <laughs> it was gone after that. <laughs> he was at peace, man. He was on board. God can do amazing things when we lead conversations under the Lordship of Christ by the power of his Holy Spirit. That's good. So good. Wow. That's amazing. Thank you, David. What else should we know? Let me just give you the floor for another second. What have we not touched on that we should touch on? Any last bits of advice, maybe even for anyone who's navigating this conversation as a church or even individually? Hmm. Well, there's a lot, there's a lot we've, we've left out. Uh, there's a lot more to explore. Um, but really it's, it's not just, um, what conclusions we come to it's how it's the, how we come to those conclusions that matters just as much. Hmm. Can we love one another? Can we listen to one another? I believe by the way, the issues of sexuality are, I believe there's some really high stakes there. And I do not believe either affirming or not affirming is going to, it's a bandaid over these issues. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to work. And I believe we can't just cavalierly cast off orthodoxy and tradition and the way God has worked in the wisdom of the church for 2000 years. Um, but it, the how we get to who we're going to be is as important as the conclusions we get to. Hmm. It's good. Dave, thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. We appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. God bless bless, uh, Coburg Alliance. And uh, you know, I I love you guys up there. I I told you my my childhood stories and memories of Coburg. So God bless. You got to come back. You got to come visit sometime here at Coburg. It'd be great to have you. If you're, you know. In the Ontario area, anyway. Well, listen, you know, um, go can, ahead. Can I just say the only place I haven't been in Canada, a uh, big city, is Ottawa, where my grandfather's oh, yeah. old 3,000 seat tabernacle, I believe it's another church now, is still there. I got to see that before I go to glory. So hopefully yeah. on my way by, I'll drop by. Before they <laughs> make a pizza place. I hear that's what happened to A.B. Simpson, right? <laughs> I, I didn't hear you, Daryl. I said before they make it a pizza place. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what happened to the old tab in oh, yeah. New York. Yeah. Well, listen, if you're tuning in and you haven't already, please do like and subscribe to the Local Churchology podcast. Share it with your friends. Share it with your family because you don't know what you don't know. And I want to leave you today with this. I want to ask you just a few questions for you to chew on as you've thought through some of the questions that we've asked Dr. David Fitch and some of the answers that he's given. What became clearer as you listened? What's still cloudy? And what next step do you need to take to move from cloudy to clear? Well, that's it for us today. We'll see you next time on the Local Churchology Podcast. Be blessed.